Eric McKinney here with USC Voice, Pete, Pete Arbogast, uh, for First and Ten this week. And Pete, thanks so much for taking the time. Welcome in. You bet. Thank you. Uh, and, and so we've done this now, a few of them with former players, and now we're going to get a, a broadcaster, a bit of a, a different look, but someone who has seen, you know, as many USC players as anybody. And so looking forward to kind of getting some perspective from you and, and hearing about some, some former teams, some former players, and really your job in bringing all of that to life and, and really kind of influencing a lot of USC fandom uh, over the years. I've been around. Get off, get off my lawn. <laughs> so well, let's jump into the first and 10, kind of some, some 10 semi uh, ra rapid fire questions to, to get your thoughts on kind of some USC history. So good, good uh, luck with the rapid fire part. Uh, the, and take as long as you want on any of them. Uh, starting off the top, and this is going to be real general for you. What stands out as the best kind of complete game wire to wire game uh, that, that you've been able to, uh, you know, broad, broadcast. Uh, I, I'm always of the, the consideration that the game uh, is the thing, and and a good game is the easiest one to broadcast. The 56 nothing is not that easy, um, and we run out of notes in the third quarter, and, and you know, then we're just talking to each other about nothing. Um, so the best games are the best games, and I I think the two best. Uh, maybe three. I can name three. And, and you look at them and you go, oh, those are just great games. The, uh, the 1990 uh, SCUCLA game at the Rose Bowl with SC 145-42. There's just nonstop action back and forth. Um, the, uh, the Bush push game, uh, and, and maybe because I've heard it so many dang times, because uh, when I'm depressed, I, I go to YouTube and I watch that. Um, and, and somebody put my my call, our call, over the top of the video. Uh, and, and so then you can get, you know, then it's really very fun. Uh, and the third one was the, the Rose Bowl game against Penn State a few years ago. Uh, all three of those were, were start to finish really amazing games. And, and, uh, and when I listen back to them, I, I, I uh, kind of get a good feeling about the work that I can do sometimes. Uh, absolutely. Sometimes, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, Looking at all the USC players you've seen, your pick for the best offensive player that, that you've seen during your tenure. Yeah, now we're talking about during my broadcasting time because, you know, I, I go, you know, there's nobody, there was nobody better than OJ Simpson. Let's just be honest with his size and, and world class speed and his shiftiness. Sure. You, you just don't get that anytime. Um, but, but during the broadcasting career, there were two, there were two guys uh, where every time they were on the field, you would sit up on the edge of your seat because you knew something was about to happen. And, and they would be Reggie Bush and didn't play offense all the time, but every time he was out there, Adore Jackson was the same way. You're like, what's going to happen now? And then flipping over to the other side, defense. And, and feel free, go ahead, uh, if, if you need to go back past your, your career as a broadcaster too on that side. Well, there was an awful lot of good players before I got here. Duh. Um, I'm kind of going to – Stick, the guy I liked watching play so much, uh, and because he was so fierce, was Ray Maluga. Uh, he could go sideline to sideline, and, and and if you didn't take good care as an offensive coordinator on the other side to watch out for where he was all the time, he would kill you. <laughs> and, and that's not all hyperbole. Uh, there are some times where he, if you got in his way, there was a bad thing. Now, one of the best players I think I ever saw that was a college football player that was never going to play in the pros, I didn't think anyway, and uh, it was Matt Grudegood or, or Chris Gallipo, those kinds of guys that, that you know are great in college and they were great in high school and they have great attitudes and they understand the game and they play it really well at a high level. Uh, I, I really like watching those types of guys play. And then changing the uniform a little bit, the best opposing player that you've seen during your career. Well, but Jerome Bettis just used to kick our butts. God, every time they gave him the ball, it was virtually, and we weren't the only ones. It's not just SC. I mean, he went to the pros and did the same thing. But uh, I wrote down Bettis, but Kenyon Barner uh, killed us. Uh, Andrew Luck was really good. Uh, watching Elway play when before I was a broadcaster, uh, even though we, we killed him every time we played him, watching him play was really fun because he was really good too. Uh, 
and I really liked the kid from Ohio State a couple of years ago, Bosa. Uh, I thought I thought he was really good. I mean, we, he was uncontainable. And and again, we weren't the only ones to say that, and they're still saying it in the pros, even though he's hurt right now. Uh, every game kind of can bring something new, maybe you haven't seen before. The thing that sticks out to you, maybe the most surprising thing, the the thing that kind of blew you away a little bit during a game. Um, the Stanford upset in the with Pritchard and, and those guys they were 40 point dogs that just doesn't happen and you know we're cocky we're coming to the stadium every Saturday thinking okay how much are we going to win by today sure um, and, and at the end of that game and I've told this story before at the end of that game uh, everybody's standing slack jawed everybody is standing in the stands just not moving they cannot believe what they've just seen and uh, the Stanford kids go over to uh, their, their band and their fans, and there aren't a lot of them there because they weren't expecting to win. So there's maybe a thousand of them as opposed to the usual crowd. And they celebrate. And then they have to run back in front of the press box uh, to get back to the tunnel to go up in the locker room. And uh, they think that the SC fans are waiting so they could throw stuff on them like the Cal fans do. Uh, and... And so uh, they put their helmets on and they start running by the stands and the SC fans on the, on the press box side start applauding the Stanford players. And the Stanford guys are like going, thanks, thanks. They're, they're, they're almost shocked at, at what's happening. And I was really proud of the SC fans. But I was kind of surprised to see that. Same, same thing happened when we played Memphis State and I wasn't a, I was a broadcaster. 1991, maybe? Um, so there's 30 years gone by. Um, and Memphis State wasn't supposed to win, and they came in the Coliseum and beat SC on opening day. And uh, Memphis State, we're doing the postgame show, and an hour later, we're just about to sign off, and the Memphis State team comes back out onto the field in full uniform to take a picture with the Coliseum scoreboard that they still sell in the, in the student store at Memphis State. So that was kind of fun. Sure. And, and – this might kind of tie in right there, but the best uh, kind of behind the scenes story, pregame, during the game, postgame, something that kind of stands out to you. Well, well, there's two. It's the Bush push game again and the Penn State Rose Bowl a couple of years ago. And they're both very similar. Um, on the, the, the third and uh, third and long play, the third, was it like third and 20? Sure. Something yeah. Like okay. And uh, I'm thinking to myself, as Paul is talking about having to throw short to Bush and not picking up all the yardage uh, at the same time, I'm totally ignoring him because I'm thinking to myself, uh, Paul, Paul McDonald, who was the color man at the time, uh, and our former All-America quarterback and academic All-America. Uh, and I'm thinking, what am I going to say when we lose finally? And I'm trying to formulate in my head because I'm not used to this. What, what, what am I going to say? And, and then you call the play, and they get the 11 yards, and now it's fourth and nine. And you have a chance, I suppose. I call the game sitting down, and uh, my, my spotter and my statistician are sitting next to me on each side. And then Paul stands up. Paul's standing up. And everybody else in the booth is sit, seated during the broadcast. And uh, Bert Awada and Mark Hoppe are, are my left and right-hand men. And uh, so here's the pass, and it's fourth and nine. And there's the pass that complete to Jarrett. And we all stand up at the same time, because now we're screaming. Um, and, and we all stand up, and the chairs that we're sitting in have all, at the same time, fallen over, <laughs> like, in backwards behind us, and a huge racket. Boom! You can hear it going, if you listen closely. Um, and then the play's over, and we turn around and look behind us, and all our chairs are, are laying on the floor, and we're all, we're all cracking up. You know, we're all laughing, because we've all done the same thing. We're all just, can't believe what we just saw. Fast forward to the Rose Bowl, and uh, we've stayed in the broadcast because we're a, we're a touchdown behind. We always have a chance, and I'm always I'm always saying, okay, we got a chance to win this because if we score and we hold them and we score again, we're tied. So we, as long as you're within a touchdown, you got a shot. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we did it, uh, and we got that interception, and now we kick the field goal. And uh, I'm no longer broadcasting to the people on the radio. Um, I'm now literally uh, leaning out of the press box window. I've, I've kind of jumped over the, the table is about 
two feet wide, probably in front of me before the window. And I've, and I've leaned all the way out to my belt buckle over the table and my, so half of my body is out of the window and I'm screaming at the fans down below me. You know, can you believe this? We've won the game, blah, blah. I'm just screaming incoherently. And, <laughs> and JJ uh, grabs my belt buckle and just yanks me and pulls me back into the press <laughs> box. So those are, those are two weird things that you know, hardly ever happen, but they That's happen great. in those days. Your, your favorite part of, of a game day? From, from beginning to end for you, which, again, for, for media, it certainly is, is longer than the fans are in the stands. I mean, oh, yeah. it, it can be a, a real full day. Your, your favorite part of, of that whole experience? I'd be curious. I'd, we'll talk about this in practice if we're allowed to go to practice because uh, <laughs> I want to know what yours is, too. Um, I don't know. Maybe you feel the same way I do. I, I've all, and I tell my wife this all the time, I like to get there so early that there's nobody there. So I'm there three and a half hours ahead of the game uh, because I like to get the feel that people are coming to a party at my house. And, and so now the people start coming in and the teams start coming out and, and the fans start coming in and filling up the stands. And now you do the game and now it's the post game show and you're wrapping things up over the course of a 40 minute post game show or so. And all your friends have had a nice party and they're all leaving and the teams are leaving and the guys mowing the lawn and doing it and they're all going home. And then you get in, you're finished and you sign off and leave it to the guys doing the talk show and you pack up your stuff and you go down the elevator and you're by yourself walking to your car in the dark Mm -hmm. uh, and thinking, wow, that was really fun. That was great. And that's my favorite part of the day is three and a half hours before and an hour and a half after the game. I, I mean, I could not agree more about before sitting there and, and just in a fully empty Coliseum yeah. thinking about what's about to happen and, and watching it fill in and then kind of taking that mental picture, you know, maybe halfway through the game and comparing it before and just seeing kind of what has, has played out. It's, it's that, that feeling way before the game where it's just empty and especially in the Coliseum where you can look out and you see the mountains and you can see downtown and that view that you get from, from the press box up there, it's, it's pretty spectacular. Someone told me, I don't know, uh, 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 someone who was trying to be a mentor or a, a role model for me, I forget who it was, but it stuck that you should um, pay attention to not just the game, but what's surrounding it. So I'm see, I can see the observatory and the Hollywood sign across the way and downtown LA over there, the San Gabriel Mountains way over there. You can see the wind blowing in. So you have to talk about that stuff. But so often for me, uh, when the game is over, it's like having driven from your workplace to your home. I don't remember anything about what happened. Because uh, it, it, from the time you sign on and say, hi, everybody, and fight on everybody at the end, it, it happens so quickly and you have to pay so much attention, close attention. You don't have a second. It's like playing a game in basketball when I was a kid in high school. If you're playing, you don't have time to think about what the score is. You're just trying to run the play and get the bucket, play defense. Sure. And the game's over and you look up and go, oh, we won. Great. <laughs> um, so it's a weird feeling uh, kind of doing the game by rote sometimes. And you may have already hinted at one of these, but but next question, the most enjoyable play call uh, of your career? The, the, the most enjoyable play call. Now, I have a couple of games that were enjoyable uh, finishes, especially not as a broadcaster, but as a fan. But the most enjoyable play call came in the second quarter of the Orange Bowl against Oklahoma. And we had just gone up 35 to 7. And uh, in the national championship game, that's pretty rare. And uh, kick the extra point. And now I say, uh, so uh, there's time out on the field with X time remaining in the game. And the score is USC 35, Oklahoma 7. And I turn to Paul and I say, on the national champion USC Trojans radio broadcasting network. And Paul, just before we get to the sign-off, goes, yep, you're right. (laughs) And it's the second quarter. So, you know, we, we were all nervous about the game coming in, but uh, that turned out pretty good. Uh, my my favorite games were, you know, if the Frank Jordan field goals to beat UCLA, um, I ran on the field after that one and uh, 
was saluting the UCLA students across the way. Uh, this was in 77. And um, I let them have it pretty good. I couldn't talk for a week. <laughs> I, had, I, was, I was just gone. And, and then he kicked the one against Notre Dame to come back and beat Joe Montana the next year. That was pretty good. And the Ayala field goal to beat Stanford in 69, the Lima Halo field goal to beat Stanford in 73. Those were comebacks that couldn't happen. You're, you're down on your own 15-yard line with a minute left and one timeout. It's, it's just impossible. Uh, and yet there they were. So, I mean, there's some great finishes. Sure. And, and USC has fielded some, some great teams during your – and sticking just to your broadcast career because that takes out – some yep. of the, the big time teams of, of years and years ago, the, the best USC team that, that you've been able to cover. I still conjecture the 72 team is the best team to ever play college football. I think uh, a lot of people would listen to that. Yeah. Uh, I think the 2004 team uh, was the best team I ever covered. Um, the 2005 team, had they not ha suffered so many injuries at the end of the year, would have won the national championship, would have beaten Texas. Uh, and they, if they were healthy, they would probably beat the 2004 team, um, but they weren't. And that's part of the game. And it's just the way it goes. And the 2008 team was no, no dog now. They were really good, too. Uh, but I'll, if I had to gun to the head, I'd say 2004 would be the best one. All right. And, and then, again, another question that, that I think you probably hit it at a little bit. But do you have any pregame kind of superstitions or, or preseason or, or anything like that, that that goes into your preparation? I'm one of the most superstitious people you will ever talk to. Okay, ever. so we've got time here for this. Ever. I'm just not going to go into it. You know, the shampoo bottle has to be in the right spot. And I mean, there's everything in the house has to be in the right place while before I leave. That's time consuming, man. <laughs> but that's like game prep for me. Um, but really, the one that everybody talks about is the Hawaiian shirt, uh, where I wear it under the, under the shirt, whether it's a polo or, or a dress shirt that I wear. Um, Back in the day, which is now 15 years ago, even more, one game I had a Hawaiian shirt under, because my statistician, Mark Hoppy, wears Hawaiian shirt, shorts, and flip-flops to every game. Every game. It could be in Notre Dame, could be 20 degrees, doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, and so I, in his honor, I wore a Hawaiian shirt this day, and I thought, you know, I'm just going to surprise him. I'm going to go out into the crowd, talk to Mike Garrett, and talk to the people, and I'll be wearing my dress shirt with a tie. But when I come back in the booth, I'm going to take it off, and I'll have a Hawaiian shirt. Well, I'll broadcast the game in a Hawaiian shirt. Uh, but I didn't. I, I had it on, but I didn't do it. Um, I think maybe because Garrett's booth was right next to us and they could see in. So I was like, eh, a little sheepish about it. I don't want to do that. Um, but late in the game, uh, SC was struggling. And, um, and it was kind of warm that day. And, and so I loosened the tie, and that didn't do it. So I took the tie off and I unbuttoned my shirt and that still didn't do it. So I finally took the shirt off and I had my Hawaiian shirt on underneath. And within one or two plays, SC scored, ended up scoring 28 points in a row, won the ball game. Now I'm stuck. Now I, now I got to do it forever. And so now every week I've got a Hawaiian shirt and it's got to be specifically a crappy Hawaiian shirt. Can't be new, can't be good. Got to be from a thrift store. It's got to be loud, garish, horrible looking. Um, and I've got them on. And, I, and for many, many games, I would wear it and we'd be in trouble and I'd peel it off and Paul would make mention of it. And it got to be a thing. Even Pete Carroll talked about it on a post-game show a couple of times. You know, when did you go Hawaiian? <laughs> and, and, uh, and, you know, it was during that 34-game win streak. We never lost. And eventually it, it kind of faded away and we started losing and so on soon. And I remember a couple times we'd lose and I'd just take the Hawaiian shirt off, wad it up and throw it out the window in the press box. <laughs> Forget that one. That's done. Sure. Um, that there were a few special ones. Yeah. I'm, I'm horrible at that. I, I fully admit it. And it's not just SC. It's, it's a Dodgers, Lakers, the Kings. It doesn't make any difference. I'm horrid. So uh, now I want to go back a little bit and start now. Now, well, obviously we're going to get into kind of how you, became a broadcaster and that, but your USC fandom certainly predates becoming a broadcaster. How, how did you, how did USC kind of become a, a team for you? And, and how did you fall into that? Uh, two things happened. Uh, my dad was in the radio business. He worked at the old UCLA station at KMPC, 710 at the time. Um, and they carried UCLA and the Rams and they were the Golden West Broadcasting Network. And so they got tickets for everything. And nobody would 
touch the SC tickets because they thought it would make a bad point to the boss somehow. Uh, so my dad said, yeah, I'll, I'll take them. So, so in 1962, now I'm seven years old in 1962, and he took me to um, the USC Duke game in 70, in, in 62. Um, and then the Navy game, two good teams. Duke was the number one or two team in the country when we played them and beat them seven to three. And Navy had Roger Staubach, who won the Heisman Trophy, and they fumbled like seven times. Staubach still calls it the worst moment of his athletic career. If you ask him, he'll, he'll tell you that every time. Because Navy would have won the national championship if they beat us. But they fumbled the ball away like seven times inside our 20. And so, so we won the game. So I saw those two games, and I saw the horse, and I saw the band. It's not the same band as it is now. They could barely form a sword. Um, and uh, what's not to like? Your team never loses. We won every game. And under the Christmas tree, I, I had an envelope with two tickets to the SC Wisconsin Rose Bowl. And I went to that, and they won that. And I got to go on the field, and I got a piece of the goalpost. And I got some turf. And I got to swat Hal Bedsall on the butt when he ran by. He almost ran me over. Um, and so I was hooked. And then my grandfather was a, a Shriner, and he would go down to the – he was big in, in that. And he would go down to Shrine Auditorium all the time. And he was working on the circus uh, in the winter that they had for kids. And uh, I, he, they were putting it together. And the, the old L.A. Classic basketball tournament was going on at the sports arena, which was a brand-new building at the time. Now it's gone. Um, eight teams from across the country, good teams, quality teams, like a real tournament. And, and he would drop me and my friend at the age of seven off with a $5 bill and say, I'll come back, pick you up tonight at eight have a good time. And he knew I was a big sports fan and everything. So now I'm, I'm watching John Rudimetkin and these guys play basketball for USC. So now I'm hooked on that too. Um, and then I kind of figured out also at the same time um, that you could listen to, uh, uh, listen to the radio and listen to sports on the radio. Uh, I think the first time I really remember that, I know I knew about TV, uh, but radio uh, was a different deal. And, and when Chick Hearn called the Lakers finals from St. Louis. I happened to be listening and I was just like, wait a minute. Uh, I like basketball and I, I can talk. I, maybe I could do that. Um, and then a record album came out in 1964 um, that Tom Kelly, the former voice of the Trojans, put out through USC with the highlights of the 64 season. I wore it out. I mean, I listened to it so much, including the Furtick to Sherman pass to beat Notre Dame number one team in the country at the end of the year. Now that team didn't do any good. They were six and four, but they, uh, they got my, uh, they got my interest and that's how I got interested in USC. And I was a lifelong fan ever since then. And I really, I, I've missed a handful of home games since 1967. I had a huge long streak from 67 to 88 interrupted when I went to the Olympics in Korea and had to, I worked for CBS radio. Um, and so I missed a, a few games there. And also when I went back to broadcast the Cincinnati Bengals for a few years, I missed some home games and I haven't missed very many home games. And of course, since 2001, I haven't missed any games at all. Can you take us through, through the broadcasting career? How, I, I mean, you mentioned your, your dad kind of giving you, uh, may, maybe a look into that, that other people might not have gotten in the same circumstance, but, uh, your, your path there, how it went and, and kind of, um, stops along the way well he, he was he was a big sports fan and made me into that uh and and i hung around radio stations you know kmpc was the station in the day so i knew all the guys that were on the station so i kind of put two and two together and i knew i wasn't going to be in the nba at any time soon so so i said i'll i'll try this and then i practiced into uh, uh he had a reel to reel old reel to reel tape recorder that i would turn down the sound on Saturday afternoon baseball games on NBC and practice play by play. And uh, later a cassette recorder when I was in high school, I would uh, practice uh, our high school games and then at LACC and then at the campus station at USC, I got to broadcast a lot of games. Uh, nobody had ever showed me how to do any of this stuff. I was just flying by the seat of my pants, which many people say is still the case. Uh, I got my first job in uh, Twin Falls, Idaho, calling uh, well, I was a, a country western DJ from midnight to six in the morning to nobody but guys milking cows. 
Um, but I did get to call the College of Southern Idaho basketball games, uh, and they had a couple of – Reggie Roby and David Thirdkill were uh, in the program uh, before I got there. But it was a really good – it was a place where major college coaches hid their talent for a couple of years before they could get to them. Uh, and the Buell Indians, which is the Native American squad that won the, the single A, the lowest division of Idaho State football that year. Uh, so I got to do that. Uh, and then I went to um, – Victorville was the next stop yeah, out in the California desert. I worked in uh, Porterville up in Central California, which is the place where I actually figured it out. Uh, Monty Moore, the uh, Hall of Fame broadcaster for the Oakland A's and Kansas City A's for many, many years, who's still alive, um, uh, had, a, had a system. They had an AM, FM station, and he broadcast games from in town in Porterville and also in the surrounding area on the FM station. Boys and girls sports, uh, a junior college, Porterville College, uh, Visalia Oaks single A baseball. We cover we, I did play by play of a track meet, um, water polo on the radio, basketball, softball, little league, anything anything that moved, we were on the radio with it. And then he had a staff which was basically made up of nothing but guys that wanted to be sportscasters. Then he would let you stay there for two years. Uh, if you were uh, a sophomore in the program, you were teaching the freshmen, and and once you were, if you didn't get a job out of Porterville after the second year there, you didn't belong in the business in the first place. And so, I moved on from there shortly, after a couple of years to Riverside. I did Riverside City College, UC Riverside uh, uh, sports there. Got a part-time job doing uh, weekend updates at KNX Radio in Los Angeles, which was the flagship for USC. Uh, that was the goal all along, was to get Tom Kelly's job when Tom Kelly was ready to retire. I was willing to stay there and wait for that to happen. And uh, in 1989, I started that in 84, and in 89, he moved over to Prime Ticket, and, and I was fortunate enough to get the job uh, as the voice of the Trojans. The, the communication, the conversations you've had with some of those guys in, in LA sports radio, what, what are some things that have kind of that, that really stuck with you when, when you have a conversation with uh, uh, Tom Kelly or, or Vin Scully or, you know, guys like that. There, there are some names, I, I think, that you've probably crossed path, paths with. All of them, uh, you know, and we, you only see each other when you're at a game and you pop your head in the booth and say, hey, you know, what's up? Um, but generally, we're all working at the same time, so you don't, you don't say hi very often. But we do see each other. We have the awards lunch at Toluca Lakes, uh, Lakeside Country Club every January. It's a good to rub shoulders with the guys. But sure, you make tons of friends in the business. And, and you, I, I don't know about them, but I listen to all of them uh, and say so regularly. I, I, I listen to Nick Nixon doing Kings hockey games. I listen to the guys doing the Bruins games because I want to know what they're saying, what they're doing. Um, there's virtually no sports on the radio that I don't listen to because I want to hear – how they do it differently compared to how I do it, how we do it compared to how they do it. Um, and, and maybe the things that I like about what they do, what, what I don't like about what they do. Uh, so we, we cheat off each other all the time, no question. And there are certain guys that have been, like Dick Enberg uh, uh, was very, very kind. When I was very young, I sent him a tape uh, and said, would you please? And he sent me back two hand page, you know, handwritten, legal notepad I mean, all the long notepad stuff about you know you don't have to listen to me but here's what i got for you uh with with comments and so on um you know there are guys like that that are that go out of their way and i like to do the same thing for the kids at the campus stations or anybody that writes to me and says you know will you listen to my stuff and tell me tell me how bad i am yeah sure uh, i'm curious and i don't know if i don't know if you'll have an answer to this but do you have an idea of, of how I guess differently you have to watch a game when you're doing what you're doing compared to just a, a fan kind of taking it in. What, what are some of the differences in, in maybe what you're looking for or what you need to notice or what you need to bring to, to a call? I was way more freaked out as a fan. <laughs> There's no prep. There's not, you're not doing anything and getting ready for the game. So you're just panicked about the game on Saturday. <laughs> all week from an early age. Um, so, so I'm really glad I got this job. Because now you're going to practice, you're going to film sessions, sometimes sitting in the back. 
uh, you're watching games on TV, you're, you're, you're looking up biographical information that you might or might not use on our team, on their team. It's nonstop all week long and you don't have time to freak out. And then the game is going and my job is really relatively simple. I don't need to know anything. Um, and as I said, many people will say that's the case. I, all I gotta do is call a play. When, when the game is really going, set the pattern, tell me who's on the field and what's the down and distance, how much time is left and what's the score. And then call, follow the ball, call the play. Now you could interject a little personality and be excited or not, depending on the, what happens in the play. But then I turn it over now to Sean Cody, JJ, Fred Gallagher, Paul McDonald. I turn it over to those guys. Tell me what happened. I didn't play football. So I, I know the game okay, but I didn't play the game like I know basketball. I know basketball inside out. Played the game in the junior college and refereed the game in the high school. I know the game inside out. So I can call basketball with my eyes closed. Because I know what's coming, I know what's happening. In football, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm okay now because I've been doing it for 30 years. Uh, but let those guys describe what just happened. As long as they shut up and give me the, the call back as soon as the huddle breaks. These days, there's no huddle, so they got to kind of time it right. So, so I call the next play. And, I was going to ask, can you take us through some of that, some of the dance? I mean, like, like you mentioned, there's a, a group of guys kind of responsible for a lot of chatter back and forth. I mean, there's a lot of information that has to kind of get conveyed quietly so that it can then be put forward publicly so, so people can, can take it in. How, how does the back and forth go? And really how much time has that taken you guys to get it to where that, that dance works and, and you can get through a, a game seamlessly? It, it is that. It's exactly that. Have you been in with us? Because I no. never know. You, you got to come in. You're, you're okay. absolutely, absolutely welcome. Please join us. Just stand behind us and watch. Now this year might be a little difficult, but it, it, when, when it gets back to normal, um, it's a three ring circus for sure. None of us on the front row pay any attention to anything that's going on behind us. It's all in front and, and next to us. I have a spotter, Bert Awada, who's been with us since 2001, uh, other guys in, in, in the early days. Uh, he tells me, um, who's, who's made the defensive play or, or, or and all, we have a cheat board. That's all. It's just a big board. And he points to the numbers and says, he didn't say anything. He just points to the numbers and I know who made the tackle. Uh, he keeps track of how many tackles each guy has sacks, so on. So if, you know, if a guy gets to a fifth, he'll, he'll hold up five fingers and let me know. And I'll say that. Um, and he'll let me know uh, about uh, important substitution changes also. But he's mute. He never says anything. My statistician for many years, Mark Hoppe, was the absolute best in the business. If you remember the TV show uh, MASH, uh, he was Radar O'Reilly. Uh, he would tell me stuff I didn't even know I needed to know until he told it to me. And, and he would have a note for me, and I'd be thinking, I wonder what, and I'd turn my face, and that would be there. Uh, he was so good. These days, we're using a stat monitor, uh, and, and it's, just, it's just not as good. It doesn't serve our broadcast as well as it should. It does it okay, but it takes them seven to ten seconds to update every play because they have to input it by typing, and it takes that long to do it. Well, we don't have that seven to ten second lag. We're live on the radio, so to have a human being in there to do that. Uh, now, I add to that fact that Mark Hoppe and I grew up next-door neighbors from the time we were little kids. So we would, when we were young, turn down the sound on the replayed USC broadcast and turn on the microphone in his room in the cassette recorder. And I'd do the play-by-play -play and he'd do the color and we'd call the USC game for practice. So I had been doing this a long time. Um, so that's, and sometimes USC would be on the road and the, so they'd be playing Minnesota at 10 in the morning our time on the radio, but we knew the game was going to be on TV on channel 11 that night at, at 11 o'clock. So we would hide out in his house and play board games all day or go in his backyard and play basketball. Whatever it was, there was no media. We would sequester ourselves until 11 o'clock and then that game was live for us. And there was no way at 1130 to go to your internet and find out who won. You, you just had to watch or wait for the paper the next day. That was it. So that was fun. Uh, where were we? I got off somewhere. 
just and, and I think now kind of how how you oh, oh, oh got one, okay. with the I color know, and, and okay that. so yeah. and then you got the color man who as we described goes back and forth with you it took me a good solid couple of years to actually not have to concentrate so much on my job and calling the play but to turn and look at you and listen to you as the color man to what you were actually saying it took really literally a year and a half of games before I was good at that um and and then I started to ask questions you know then it's a give and take so you start asking questions what about this what about this uh and you don't always have to agree with your color man uh, but they just have to shut up in time for you to call the play uh, then there's a producer who hands you the, the little cards that you have to read for sponsors. Make sure you go to timeout on time. Make sure you know that you're back on the air on time so you don't say anything stupid. The guy behind us is the engineer. He, he runs all the controls, make sure uh, everything works technically. Now we have a field announcer. Uh, so we're told when he's got something ready to go, Jordan Moore is our guy right now. He's also the uh, social media director at USC's athletic department. Uh, we've had, JJ was that guy before. Uh, before that, uh, I actually did that. I was the first one to ever do that. Uh, 88 Notre Dame game and uh, the 89 Rose Bowl game. Uh, the last two games of that season were the last two games that Tom Kelly was the play by play announcer for, and I was the sideline announcer. So that was the first time SC had ever tried that. It's a, it's a whirling dervish of things going on at the same time. And, but I will say this when it goes well, and when you have a family that you trust and love, there's nothing like it. I've worked in situations in other towns with other staffs that I did not get along with. And then you don't look forward to coming to work and it's not that fun. You could still do the job, you could still be a professional, but it's not the same. And to go in there and talk with your friends and then have them do the job and know what their role is and know what our role is and we all work together, it's a team effort. And when, you know, if I, I win an award for being a play-by-play -play guy of the year, it's a, it's all six of us, no question about it. What's the biggest difference your first year to this? I mean, obviously not this year, but but maybe last year, the the most uh, recent year. I know a lot more. Uh, plain and simple, I know a lot more about the game, uh, and I'm you know the first year doesn't count because I'm just wetting my pants mostly. <laughs> uh, the, the highest level of football I had done coming into doing uh, USC games in 1989 was Riverside City College. Uh, I got the job with an, uh, 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 an audition tape where Mark Oppie and I went on the, the press box roof at the Coliseum and, and called the uh, Rams 49ers preseason game um, just so they could have something a little more tenuous to look at. And, and it worked along with a huge letter writing campaign and all sorts of things happened. The gods were smiling that day. Um, I think that's the biggest difference. I, I, confidence. You've done something for so long. You're confident in your ability to sell the product, talk, I believe in the product, sell the product, talk about the kids on the football team, sell them, make them look good, uh, as good as you can, uh, and have fun and entertain uh, so that people listen to these games and they think back and go, that guy really did it right. The same way I look back at listening to Tom Kelly and say, man, that guy really did it right. Right now you get Keaton Slovis, you get Graham Harrell's offense. Uh, I'm curious kind of your thoughts on this current team that, that you're going to be able to talk about right now, How, where, where they fit in in terms of kind of USC history and teams that you look forward to, to being able to talk about because – you got to assume in, in a second year under Harold that offense is likely gonna gonna be rolling uh, here here this season. I do want to mention one more thing before I talk about those guys is is you you made mention of this year's broadcasts, oh, sure. and we don't know what we don't know what that's going to look like. Mm -hmm. Most of the broadcasters in town have been at home for home games, but have been at home for road games also. Um, they want us at least so far as I know. Uh, my boss wants us to go on the road with the team and because the broadcast will simply be better. Uh, I think that's a long shot. I'm hopeful that it'll happen that way, but it's a long shot. So let's assume that we're going to be calling the game off TV monitors while sitting in an empty Coliseum. Uh, that I, I, I'm not sure how that's going to work yet. Mm -hmm. I, I want to make sure that the TV monitors have the right pictures for me. I, I need a 
I need a, a fair close-up like usual of the play that's about to unfold with the two lines of scrimmage. But I also think I need a wider shot so I can see when the pass goes kind of where it's going and who's it going to. Sure. Um, you wait for the camera to catch up. You, you've got to wait in your call to say, oh, that's intended for. And then you wait for the camera to switch over to the guy that's going to catch the pass. I'm hoping we get to practice one if we do that ahead of time, since there's plenty of conferences playing football already uh, that we get to go into some booth somewhere and, and we don't hit the ground cold on, on November the 9th. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, this was supposed to be one of the best USC football teams over the last few years, probably the best since that Rose Bowl team that beat Penn State. Uh, without Tufele and Elijah Vera Tucker, they come down a little bit, certainly, but Oregon suffered their losses as well, and every team's lost a guy or two. Um, I understand that Elijah Vera Tucker and Jay Tufele are seriously considering uh, reneging on their plans to play, to leave early and come back and play these eight or nine games, eight games probably, uh, and that would make USC the prohibitive favorite to win the South for sure. Uh, they've got all the pieces in place, a good offensive line to protect Slovis, who is fantastic, going to get better. Great receivers, despite the loss of Pittman. Super running backs, a very good defense. Should be a very good football team. And, and new coaches is the, only, is the only negative on that. And it's not negative because they're not good coaches. It's negative because it takes time for players to adjust to new coaches. Um, so let's hope that that happens quickly. Uh, and, and they're able to show what they can do in these new systems. Absolutely. I, I, I want to move a little bit off the field and, and let you kind of talk about some of your your hobbies and, and your work away from USC and, and away from the broadcast booth. Uh, and and uh, something about you that, that's clearly very important is volunteering and, and being kind of active in the community. Can, can you kind of just get Give us a, a look into a, a lot of the stuff that you do, again, outside of the, the broadcast booth. Well, I'm, I've been volunteering and occasionally have been paid uh, by various YMCAs in, in the state of California. Most recently, Santa Monica. I was the, directing their youth basketball program for the last, uh, up until two years ago, for probably 10 years before that, um, which is great. I mean, we had 300 kids and 30 teams and we played year round, you know, four seasons year round, basically. Uh, and, and you make a lot of friends doing that. And now that was a job where I actually got money, um, but not a lot, but some. Um, and I volunteer every year to go to mountain camp. Uh, I've done that since I was a kid. I, I started off as a camper, was a junior counselor, then a counselor, then a director, uh, a week, sometimes more. Uh, Santa Monica owns its own camp at Big Bear, uh, and, and we take 300 kids and a staff of about 60, uh, which now include um, one of my daughters and my wife and one of my sons, and they've all been, uh, the, uh, all the kids have been at one point or another. Um, and most of my closest friends in the world uh, come from having worked at Mountain Camp uh, over the years uh, with, with the YMCA. It's a wonderful program. And I'll do it till I can't do it anymore. Till I can't walk up from campfire to the to the mess hall, and then they'll have to wheel me up. It's it's okay. Uh, and I do some work. I do some um, volunteering, although they won't let me do it because I'm 65, and uh, you know you're of a certain age at a hospital. They don't want you there, and I don't really want to be there either. Um, so I, I do some volunteer work at a local hospital in Santa Monica as well. We, we uh, my wife and I have a pie giveaway on Thanksgiving. We think it's not gonna happen this year, but we're working on maybe some alternative um, where we uh, solicit donations from uh, friends, five, 10 bucks each. We ended up with 600 bucks or so. We go out and buy pies and all the accoutrements and uh, stand on the Venice boardwalk and, and hand out pieces of pie to the, to the skaters and the homeless guys and the foreigners and the pe just the people walking by. And they all think you're from some religious cult so they don't want to, you know, they don't want to take it at first, but they wander around eventually and they, they figure, well, what are you doing this for? Because we want to, because it's Thanksgiving, why not? So you try to do as much as you can in your community to make the community a better place. What, what was it, either growing up or, or something in adulthood, what, what kind of instilled that in you, that, that desire to, to give back? And, and well, the YMCA edict is, is one of uh, uh, self-betterment, goal setting, and, and, uh, and, uh, 
uh, giving to, to, to others. And uh, uh, I was I, from a broken family, so I ended up in the YMCA program as, uh, from an early age, you know, going to day camp when I was six. Uh, but they instill that in you. It's a, it's a mantra of theirs. It's, you know, the YMCA is supposedly a religious organization, but it's not at all. Um, and yet they give you guidance about how to be a good human being. And, and if you can in turn become the person that has been giving you that guidance, then you go on and, and share that with others. And over the years, you know, many of us that have done this for many years have been able to share that for thousands and thousands of kids that have come along. And some of those are coming up through the ranks now are counselors in, a, in our camp. And that's, that's a great thing to see because you're leaving it off to the next group. Sure. And then going back into the booth and, and kind of finishing up, hopefully we've got you for, for years and years and, and hearing that voice, but when it's, when it's done, when you look back, what do you feel like are, are some of the strongest memories, strongest feelings you, you're going to have from your time here? And then, and then also, if I could throw a, a two-parter in, what, I guess, what would you like to be remembered for? What, what would you like kind of your... Yeah, I'm, already getting, I'm already getting choked up now, you see. Uh, I, I don't think Again, I don't, I'm not shorting you years here. We, we know we still got you for a while. Don't think I'm not thinking about it. Um, there are a couple of personal goals. I'd, I'd personal goals that I'd like to accomplish in 2025. I'll pass Chris Roberts and I will have broadcast more, uh, division one college. I will have broadcast more college football than anybody in the history of Southern California radio. He did Long Beach State and UCLA for a bunch of years, and, and I'll catch him and pass him in 2025. He's a good friend of mine, despite the fact that he's a Bruin. Um, so I'd like, to, I'd like that for sure. And then just beyond that, if I can get to 2030, or 2029, uh, that'll be 40 years. That qualifies you for possible uh, inclusion into the College Football Hall of Fame for the Chris Schenkel Award. Uh, and then in 2030, if I can get a game in in 2030, uh, that'll give me parts of six decades because I started in 89 uh, and that'll never be broken. You're not going to get seven decades. So six would be good. Uh, so my goal is to get to 2030 if I can. Um, what are you remembered for? I, bringing enjoyment and excitement to people who love this thing that we love, USC football. Uh, and basketball. I did the basketball games for a long time. Um, and if you can bring that kind of excitement to people and they remember, oh man, remember that? Here's, you know, here's that call. Now in the old days, it was tough to find a call from Tom Kelly because you had to go to a record album. He made one in 64, they made one in 74. And occasionally you'd have a, a tape of a game that you did yourself that you still have. Like I've got a few, but there are very few. Um, KNX has some somewhere put away in some vault, but not a lot, not a lot. Now we cut fast forward to the technological age that we're in and you can go back and hear every call of every game. Uh, I've got every tape and every disc, uh, on CD or on a thumb drive in my garage, you know, unless we have a tsunami, we're in good shape. I think USC has got the same. Um, so you can go back and, and pick out the highlights, you know, and, and listen to those plays. So, you know, who doesn't know the fourth and nine call? Um, and, and I, I think that's it. Just allowing the people that have been listening that are fans of USC football to remember those moments. And if I'm the catalyst between the actual moment and their remembrance of it, that's, that's what I want to be remembered for. Cause that's what I remember Tom Kelly for. Absolutely. Yeah. I think like you mentioned, those, those connections between the fans and, and those moments, uh, I think that's a, a, a huge part of, of what you will be remembered for. So I uh, appreciate everything that, that you've kind of brought to all USC fans and, and all of us. And, and thank you so much, Arbo, for, for taking the time to, uh, to chat with us today. Eric, you the man. All right. Hopefully we'll see much more of you during the uh, 2020 fall football season that, that we're about to embark on. Fight on, everybody. Take care.